Well, I think innately, at least for myself and most people that I know of in IT, is we're problem solvers. And anytime we're presented with a problem, whether it's the problem of an end user not understanding what they're doing or the problem of an actual software or hardware issue, uh, is getting through it in as efficient method as possible and getting a full understanding of that end user, understanding that maybe if it's a training issue, whatever it might be, how we can get through to fix that problem currently and how to prevent it from occurring again. Yeah, similar to, to John, um, I like the, the project work. I, I like to start new projects. I kind of have sometimes a hard time finishing them to the end. Um, I love starting new things and then starting another project and then kind of drifting off to another project. But um, yeah, so I, I like all the, the projects that kind of drive things forward, um, you know, new things that allow me to like ner learn new technologies and things like that. Um, and then outside of that, just kind of working with the users too, because a lot of, I, I feel like a lot of users today are kind of sometimes intimidated by the IT people only because they can be condescending and things like that. So I, you know, try to be, uh, you know, as nice and, and open and not condescending as possible just to try and explain because it's, it's great. It's kind of like, I, I guess, what a teacher would have in a sense where, you know, you, you teach somebody something and then when you actually see them learn that and they actually, you know, start to become self-sustaining to where you don't have to keep teaching them all the time. I mean, that's, that's gratifying too, so I think uh, between the project work and just kind of working with the end users to make sure that they're you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing and making my job easier, then in that sense, that's kind of what I, what I enjoy. Uh, most significant project. Sure. Uh, that would actually be probably the entire environment I operate currently today. Um, when I started there, it was a band-aid on a band-aid on a band-aid on a band-aid and so on and so forth for a long time. Uh, and, and since then, you know, it's, it, really has been multiple smaller projects, but we've broken it down. Uh, and, and really you could consider it one big project of taking all these band-aids off, getting rid of 11 physical machines, because every time they needed a new application, whether it could run on another machine or not, we bought a new machine and overbought that machine. And so now we've consolidated it down. We've got you know a SAN and, and a VMware environment. Everything's virtualized and, and kind of make, you know, taking this, this big piecemeal network that, that was put together by the biggest nerd in the company at the time and making it one consolidated, cohesive thing. Uh, that's probably been the biggest project I've done. I don't know that they intended the Band-Aids to be ripped off, but they recognized that they could no longer survive just having the biggest nerd take care of it at the moment. You know, the, the guy that was operating it, you know, when he and I built the network, uh, and then, you know, seven years later and I came back, he just didn't have time to do his day job and IT and everything else. The company's evolved and the systems are so much more complex. And so I think it might have been a twinkle in their eye of the idea of like, hey, we could streamline this with the guy. But uh, I think their initial reaction was just, hey, we need somebody to manage this full time. <clears throat> Similar circumstance, uh, when I started with Satel, my predecessor had been there. He, he liked to brag that his first day at Satel was when they filmed the scene from the Blues Brothers in 79, where they went off the end of the home bridge. Anyway, he'd been there for 29 years and he up stopped updating his skills about 10 years into it. So when I came in, I kind of took the lay of the land and I went to the directors and or the shareholders and I said, it's going to cost some, but we're going to get up to speed. And we're very similar, not so much a band-aid, it was just duct tape and rickety death waiting to happen. Um, but yeah, we went from several servers that were probably, I think the worst I had was like 178 patches the first time I went through. And it just, and then when they finished, I got to do like another 70, but um, yeah, there was a lot of not updating. There was a lot of, his favorite word to tell him was, no, it can't be done. Um, so they loved me for the first year when I was like, oh yeah, I could do that. And then I learned to say, no, it can't be done. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's good and bad to both. You try to make good of every situation. Um, I think sometimes uh, we talked about some of the, the stuff that we have to do inevitably has to be done in hours that generally aren't business hours and that takes time away from family and you know um, <laughs> one of my disaster stories is I was in Florida at Blizzard Beach and had to rebuild a SQL server because the president on the f of the company was on the phone saying we need this up tomorrow and my wife is going you know we're on vacation well so that the, the drawback is you sometimes have to put aside 
let's say, I don't want to say a normal life, but hours that normally your family would expect you to be home or be doing things, and you got to go, hey, I, I have to do this now because if I don't, I, I'll never get it done. Or, and so that's, that's hard to explain to wives and, and children sometimes. And I can echo that. I was at a state track meeting up on the cross, and my daughter was, you know, fortunately not running at the moment, but out in the parking lot, uh, remoting in, fixing servers, and spending about an hour and a half uh, doing uh, doing some repair work. But you, you just gotta stop and, and, and take care of what needs to get done, and if you do it right away, usually it just makes life a lot easier. But it's that interruption that we're constantly facing. And, uh, and adding to that is, is, you know, you've got the end user component where people innately put off Contacting IT. This has been happening for three weeks. <clears throat> yeah, I now. Correct. Yeah, and, and we get notified at five o'clock on a Friday <laughs> about a problem that's been occurring for weeks or days on end. And, you know, there's a huge sense of urgency, at least portrayed in that email or whatever. And, and so just that lack of communication sometimes. Um, you know, I mean, I. I accept more of the interruptions and things on during off hours a lot more so than I sometimes accept that. That's the one thing that, uh, from a, an end user to your IT department uh, uh, standpoint, the quicker you get even little bits of information and start the dialogue of a problem, um, the happier we are. Uh, I'd rather have some information sooner than no information and getting it hit with it all at a very late in the day uh, inconvenient uh, a moment. So if, if you could, uh, if you could get your users to remember one thing, what would that one thing be? Keep an open dialogue with IT. I mean, just get to know your IT department, just to talk with them and, and let them know the nuances of things that you're experiencing. How do you do your job? What are things that are problematic in your job? Um, things that don't open as quickly as you'd like. Some things we can work on. Some some things are just the way the computer works. You can't fix everything, but the more we understand your role and your deadlines and your things that you're trying to do, the better we can help curtail the expectation or fix the problem. So, I mean, it's a two-way combined uh, communication process. Yeah, I'll keep it even simpler. I, I just read things before you click on them. That's like the biggest problem I think I have with users. It's just like, I go over there because they're having an issue and I like stand over their shoulder, all right, tell me what you're doing, show me what you're doing. Well, they go through and they're typing something and then they click and a window pops up, they click and then they click again. I'm like, whoa, what, what, what just happened? What did that say? Well, I don't know, I just click okay. I'm like, all right, just kind of slow down and let's go through that. So I think it's just that, that awareness, you know, you're, you're using a computer and I love to tell the user base, it's like, Computers do what you tell them to do, despite what you think otherwise. Like they don't have a mind of their own, even though sometimes it can seem that way. But just take your time and just work with it, and kind of, and then kind of what John says, just make note of what you're doing. So then, when IT can come around, we can come around. We can help you as quickly as we can because you know the exact steps you went through, what you were doing. So yeah, just kind of take your time. Yeah, I mean, I would echo all that same stuff and and say that you know if if. If the users, you know, that I work with could, you know, the, you know, to that to that respect, you know, be cognizant of, of what they're doing, what they're going for, when I come to them and, and be understanding of, hey, I don't know what you've been doing, I don't know what your day to day is, I need to understand what you what what you did. So I'm going to ask you a, a million and one questions. I don't mean it condescending. I don't mean to belittle you, but I have to understand what you're doing, how you're doing it, and and where it's going to go. And so you know, like I. I you know, I feel proud, I've trained my wife a little bit. And her IT department has told me, she's like, no, she's one of the best users because she calls with a problem and says, hey, this is what I've done, right? These are the steps I've taken. I've, you know, my, my husband trained me, so I've done these troubleshooting steps. But, you know, she understands the questions they're gonna ask and kind of goes to, to them, you know, saying, hey, I have this issue. How can, how can I give you the most information to make my day better? You know, and that would be the thing that I would want everybody to know is, is understand that we don't know what you're doing or how you do your job or why this is important or that's important. We just know that you're mad and we don't want you to be mad at us. You know, so we need to, you know, we need to figure out what that is. So like, you know, try to think about like the questions we might ask you or the, the, 
you know, the questions I asked you the last time and, and be prepared to answer those questions or at least kind of know where it's going and have that patience with us while we work this problem out through with you. Uh, so, yeah. No, I think he'd win. Um, it's funny that, because I was actually going to say, you stole my thunder, because my wife is my, her IT department's favorite person, because she knows how to do a screenshot. She knows to tell them exactly what steps she was taking. She does not click OK. She's got it stuck there. She's like, OK, here's what the message says. What do you want me to do? And they love her. So there's that. The, the, the other thing I was going to say is a ticket never killed anybody. So if you have an opportunity, if you've got a ticketing system or a help desk, you can throw so much information in there and shorthand it so that when we open that ticket, we've got everything we need to know. So, well, most everything, or everything you know that we need to know, and then we'll figure out the rest. Uh, something that I've been dealing with lately from a, like a security standpoint is um, there are certain, let's say, protocols that we have in place, and the whole, it's hard for, uh, from a business standpoint for people to understand. The whole reason is to, to stop you from doing something that's going to hurt yourself or hurt the company kind of thing. So, yeah, sometimes it makes it slower or maybe even less efficient from a grand business perspective. You have to stop and, like you said, maybe click on something or you have to call some, should I do this? And the people who don't understand, like, to try and zoom through it and get it done, you need to call IT. This has to be done right away. Well, yes, but the reason we have those steps is so you don't shoot yourself in the foot and cause more problems. So you just have to have a little bit of pain. And, and yeah, in, 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 the, in the whole world, yes, it takes longer, maybe a little bit. But if we don't do it that way and you make a mistake, the, the consequences are so great that we're just gonna we're gonna keep it that way. Um, and then you know, the, the end user doesn't like that answer, but that, that's part of our. Is what I see as my job is to, to save you from yourself a little bit. How many uh, internally your companies tr proactively train end users? Well, last year we actually did start trying to do a proactive security training. Right. And, you know, on the heels of doing a, a fake phishing attack to the end users and seeing how many people click. And since we've been running that same kind of training where every quarter I'll take the those that show up on the naughty list, as I call it, and uh, have clicked emails that shouldn't, um, but they're ones that we're sending out to, to kind of bait them into it, so they can understand what the interface is in that email. Uh, looking at, this really didn't come up from a real address. This really is trying to get you to click on something that is not, you know, is not really eBay or PayPal or, or uh, you know, the banking system or whatever it is that it's saying that it's coming from. Um, and that's paid off a hundredfold. Um, it really has. We, you know, we try to spend, I think the total investment of going through with my team and getting them to do the, this training, uh, uh, we put in about maybe 10 hours uh, every quarter. And um, that's paid off huge. We do a lot of reactive training, but uh, to your point about the fishing, we actually, I, when I was in the morning session, I got an email. We had our first 100% nobody clicked on a fishing campaign, so I'm gonna I'm buying lunch for him tomorrow, um, and I mean that's kind of one of the things I like to do too is to foster that relationship with the users and make them not hate me. It doesn't work, but I try. Well, you know, I'd have to have policies to to, to have that. Uh, we're working on it though. You know, we're a growing company. You know, I've I've it, you know. IT is new to our business. You know, we've doubled in size in the last few years, so we're we're going through these growing pains and trying to figure out what does that mean for us. And so, you know, we've started things like a company newsletter that goes out, and you know, I'll put a little article in there of like, hey, here's how to help me troubleshoot your problem, or don't share your passwords. Um, you know, and so as we come up with policies and things, we're emailing the users and trying to explain it to the best of our abilities to them of, hey, this is why we need this policy. This is why everything's behind a VPN. I know it sucks, but but this is this is the reason we're doing it, and so we try to do that. Um, you know, and as we're going through it, you know, we're actually just starting to implement uh, what John did, which is phishing and spoofing training um, and testing to our environment. So it's something we're working on, but right now, you know, and I'm sure most IT environments are this way, is just reactive. You know, oh, you got ransomware. Okay, great. Well, let's teach you what ransomware is, and and 
here's how to prevent it. You know, don't click these links, or you know, we're going to institute these policies. You know, my wife's uh, work is a great example. They had ransomware and, and had 500,000 files, which was just over 60% of their file server encrypted. Uh, luckily, they had great backups and were able to recover from it. But as a result of that, they no longer accept email attachments and a whole host of other things to prevent them from getting infected again. Yeah, I'll agree. I mean, similar um, experiences with um, something bad happens, and then we write a policy about how to prevent it in the future. Um, and again, my, my personal job isn't always to disseminate that policy, but in practice, I'm the only one that's really enforcing that policy because everyone else is trying to be more efficient. So, uh, you know, HR, who, you know, whatever manager will put out a policy email blast or a, a training session, and then it's up to me and, and, and my department to, uh, to actually check that everybody's using that policy correctly. Yeah, I think although we haven't gone through any kind of formal user training, it is on the second half of this year to actually have something like that uh, formally. But I think right now we've, I've just used the help desk uh, for any kind of ticket that comes in, I try to not just close the ticket with problems fixed. I tend to like, this is what happened. This is, you know, kind of give them a synopsis to, in the sense, so next time if that problem does happen, hopefully the idea is they go to the ticket portal first to potentially make the ticket, but then they see, oh yeah, I had that ticket last week that it was the same problem. They can read it, and maybe you know, I'm dreaming, I know, but read that ticket and actually fix it the second time themselves. Um, so more or less that and then just if I have to go over to help somebody with something you know I try to again try and teach them don't do this this is what caused it that kind of thing and then again the idea is you leave them a little bit smarter than they were before the problem so that's kind of how we've handled it so far. What advice would you give for uh, implementing successfully both you know, the actual rollout and then getting users to engage and fill out a ticket when they are submitted ticket? Yeah, I think, I mean, picking something that's super easy is going to be number one because, I mean, we've goes back to several conversations or, you know, mentions that we've had. You just want to keep things simple. They want to keep it quick. They want to have something that they can just go to and get solved. So if, as easy as you can make it on the user as possible, um, like we use email because everyone uses email. People just love rattling off email. So uh, tickets are created by email. So if they have a problem, they put in, you know, subject body, this is my problem, and then send it off. and. Uh, that creates a ticket, so um, as easy as possible, uh, and then something, something kind of communication wise to get back to them as soon as possible too, because it's pretty amazing. Again, the quickness they create the ticket, and then five minutes later they're like, uh, "Where are we with this? I haven't seen the response yet." It's just like I got five other tickets I'm working on right now. Like, give me a break. But um, so yeah, communication and just ease of deployment on the users. I'd say. In our case, we do accept tickets by email, but we urge and have trained people to open up a portal. Um, so our ticketing system does have a portal, and I think one of the things is, is what in the initial, if I go back and restart it all over again, designing that portal uh, right from the beginning was key, and training the end users around that portal to begin with. So on the portal itself, it has categories of help desk ticket uh, resolutions or work instructions to resolve their issue. So by going to that portal right off the bat, there's the, the, you know, right away the very first tab is, what are things that are there that I can use to solve my problem without having to involve, involve IT? Maybe the answer is already there. And so things like how to set up my voicemail, how to fix, uh, how to reset my password, how to reset my password when I'm not in the, in the office, uh, how to use Outlook web access, um, <clears throat> kind of a knowledge base itself, but work instructions for each of these various most common tickets. And then from there, they can go to the next tab over and actually create a ticket. But they can also see, in our case, we have 20 different buildings outside of our corporate office. They can see their building's location and any tickets related to their specific location. So as nuances are different in certain offices, they might see what somebody else either previously or one of their coworkers might have had for a problem. So designing that portal around this really made a big difference and training the users around that made a huge difference. To go there first quite often because you know it might be a couple hours before we get back to them. Uh, they can spend five or 10 minutes looking at that and get their own resolution right off the bat. And then seeing that history uh, is key. But educating them that 
by using the ticketing system, what the purpose is behind it, and how it helps us create tracking and understanding so that if we see really there's a multitude of tickets after looking at it for six months, all on similar topics, maybe we have a system issue, maybe we have a training issue, maybe we have something else that's identifiable that we can help fix and be more proactive within our network or within our training to circumvent people's problems. Yeah. I, I would totally actually agree. It's, it's about ease of use, um, no matter how you break it down, whether it's sending an email, going to a portal and filling it out, just you know, making sure the users know what information to provide and how can I quickly just get that into the system. So we use, uh, our, ours is all currently email based. We have the ability to do a portal, we just don't do it yet currently. <clears throat> I think the best thing that we did with it was first we started out with about four users. We took people from different departments, really deep dive, went in, got them fully trained, fully invested, and made them champions of it and in it so that when we were ready to roll it out to everybody else, they were evangelists, for lack of a better term, for us. They were like, this is going to work and it's great, you just got to do it. and then. Uh, once we rolled it out, we pretty much put our foot down that there was that was how you got in, got it into us. It, it, we we did the uh, doctor's office analogy. Um, if you're setting an appointment, it goes via ticket. If you're in the ER, you can call me. But if it's just something that's not an emergent need, you put in a ticket because that's how we. And I I told him that's how we justify our existence is we can document, we can show what we're doing. Because otherwise, IT is just off in a closet somewhere and you don't know what they're doing. This is a good way for us to be able to report back to management. Here's the problems we're encountering. Here's how we're solving them. Here's who our problem children are that we're going to work on and try to get them so they put in less tickets or they have less issues to create the tickets. So, yeah, and they still try to, we call it mugging. If I'm on the way to one ticket and somebody's like, hey, come here, that's mugging and we don't, we don't do it. Click happy. Guys that uh, get an email, and we got one that in you know, one of our early phishing campaigns, he actually clicked on a, uh, well, we got two. One clicked on one that, a link that said, view the ugly sweater photos from last year's Christmas party. There was no Christmas party with ugly sweaters, but he clicked on it because he had to see it. Uh, and another one said it came from HR at Satel.com. Spoofed address, wonderful. Um, and it said uh, the attached spreadsheet has everybody's salaries. Click here. And he did. And he tried it. He's like, well, I figured you guys were, I, I don't know. And he just couldn't defend it. But it was just, yeah, I still browbeat him for that. And the ugly sweater guy. So I got him an ugly sweater after the fact. No, no. Never, ever forget. You know, for, for me, it's, it's kind of, you know, I, it's not necessarily click happy, but it's, it's not knowing what the users are going to do. Uh, you know, users have uh, immense power, at least in my environment, they can, you know, install things, click on things, download things, go to places that I don't know they're going. And, and for me, the fear isn't so much what they do or what they click on, but can I recover from that? Do I have the ability, you know, are my backups solid? Do I have a, a copy of the data? For their machine, you know, what's going to be the impact when they click on the wrong thing or uh, somehow, you know, infect the entire system with, you know, ransomware? And now we're, you know, hoping that, you know, it's only losing a day of data or, you know, and not two, three weeks of data. And so part of that is the compounding fear of when do I find out about it, right? Because as users don't report issues, and wait and hold on to those things until it's the last minute, they're at their deadline, they're, they're in the emergency mode. Well, they, they might have had this issue for two or three weeks. Well, that might mean in order for me to fix the problem or un undo whatever they did, I have to go back two or three weeks, which means that's a huge amount of loss of data because that's when the infection started. So that's what keeps me up at night. Uh, I guess from a CEO standpoint, and I, I was in his office not that long ago, we were kind of having a similar conversation of, you know, I and IT, I want you to spend a lot of money 
to fix or to make things better? And how do I know that the money I'm spending today is really going to be worth it tomorrow? Because something better is going to be out there tomorrow. So I want to know what's going to be there tomorrow. And I'm like, I, I'd love to be able to tell you what's out there tomorrow, but I don't predict the future. If I did, I'd be working somewhere else. Um, so all we can do is, is spend the best money we can today and, and try and make it last as long as possible. But and I know that keeps him up and there, you know, I generally sleep okay, but you know, if, if I had to make all those decisions on my own, it would be, you know, if, if we're going to spend all this money, are we really getting that benefit, or, or is you know, the next Uber or whatever coming out tomorrow that's going to make our industry completely obsolete if we spend money on this today? So it's um, difficult. I have to say everything that they're saying. I mean, click happy things that are out of our control are kind of the biggest things that uh, are stressful for any IT manager. Um, end users being a big component of that. Network outages, things that are relying on telecom companies to provide us that connectivity. If that goes down, how crippled are we? Are we investing in the right carriers to keep us in a, a redundant fashion so that we're not you know, going to be having a downtime? Yeah, I think similar to what these guys have said, uh, security is big. I mean, it's a real conversation I have with my president fairly often. He's like, tell me we're secure, tell me we're doing everything we can, because it's just you want to you wanna do as much as you can to make sure that you're you know, protecting yourself. Um, but there's, I always, I always tell them there's a healthy sense of paranoia and there's an unhealthy sense of paranoia. So, I mean, it's totally healthy to want to know that you're protected. Um, and again, there's that kind of security piece where a lot of people want to be super secure, but they don't necessarily want to pay to be super secure because that's kind of a direct relationship with that as well. Um, outside of that, I think just backups, kind of like these guys said, I have a reoccurring 15-minute meeting with myself every morning to go over yesterday's backups just so I know for sure that yeah everything is good, um, just so I can restore. And then I'm just recently, again, with the backup thing, because it's getting more and more, just want to make sure you're secure with all this ransomware and stuff that's out there is to try and do like either weekly or bi-weekly just some restores of some kind, you know, some kind of substantial restore. Because already, I mean, starting this, I found that some of the backups that I've had didn't restore to the degree that I liked. So then I immediately kick off like another incremental backup just to make sure that I'm covered and so that the next go around of restores it actually works. Because that's that's the biggest fear, I think, you know, doing these restores and you're like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's backing up, we're good, 100%, and then you go to restore and nothing restores or the restores broken or something like that. It's corrupt, yeah. So I think that just the security and recovery is, today is, is huge. Uh, looking back on your career so far, what would be the one thing tip that you would give them just starting um, I think IT, in terms of, uh, it's kind of a balance between introvert and being personal. I think you gain a lot more knowledge if you try and be more personable, especially with the end users or whatever t group or team you're working with. I mean, if, if you can kind of keep that open communication and just be somebody that can be approached, I think um, you tend to hear about more problems, uh, which means you can hopefully fix them uh, quicker. Um, outside of that, just, I mean, try and stay up to date. I mean, find a couple of resources that try to feed you information in terms of what's out there, what's what's coming technology-wise, just to kind of stay, uh, keep a pulse and maybe join a committee or some kind of regular group, you know, meeting in your area with other people like this kind of panel of IT people, because everyone is doing something differently, and to be able to kind of get that sense, get that background on what they're doing, to kind of feed what you can do. In other words, join the Spice Works group. <laughs> I run the Milwaukee Spice Works group for, we meet every other month. A um, Couple things, I have interns come into my into my office, or you know, every semester we, have, we try to have a new intern working with us, so it's not a far off question for what we try to get across to them. Um, one is, I try to advise them, learn communication. Get out there, communicate, take a public speaking class, do something that you're able to, to communicate with people on all different levels. Because in our industry, we're supporting CEOs, we're supporting all the C-levels, we're supporting end users. In my case, you know, we go from care staff people that are um, and, and maintenance people that are on the lower pay scale to the to the high end, and uh, so we have to really be able to adapt, not only just in, in communicating on a proper level, but you know just a, a similar language 
that they can understand. And uh, you know, and the other component is innately IT people get into it because they're really passionate about technology or passionate about learning technology. That really is a no-brainer. But really, to get out and learn business, um, you've got a business degree, and that was one of the things that you had talked about. Um, understanding how what we do impacts every aspect of a business and how important the different departments are and how that interrelates. And uh, that's a real key component as well. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, and something I've learned even after you know college and everything in the working life is um, some of the most I don't want to offend anybody. Some of the most important people in the business are salesmen, right? They generate revenue. That's that's where the that's where the the meat is, right? Well, even even for me, I have to be a salesman to a certain extent from time to time, whether it's to my boss or my CEO or the end user who I have to sell on the idea that, yeah, it's going to be a little bit slower, but this is a good idea. And learning techniques on how you can communicate with people that isn't just dictating to them how it's going to be, because everyone pushes back that way, but to remind them that's in their best. I mean, all those kind of sales techniques that you might learn in a, you know, taking a sales class, something like that. Man, if, if you can develop some of those skills, even on a little minor level in day-to-day -day interactions, you, you develop this savviness in your um, business that um, just makes things easier. Yeah, I would, I would you know, piggyback on everything that everybody's already said. And, and the thing that I would add to it is, as we, you know, as, as you go along or start in this career, somebody's just starting in, into IT, is, is be a sponge. Just learn everything, whether it be technology or the business process that you're supporting. Um, you know, because the more you know and the more you learn, the more valuable you are for that company, which sometimes for the CEO is, you know, I know that's my boss's biggest fear is that I'm going to leave someday. You know, because I know all the business processes. I can jump into anybody's job. I know how to do it. Am I good at it? No. But, but I know that. You know, so don't don't have this ego around uh, the technology and this is the latest and greatest and oh, iPhone's better than Android or whatever the situation might be. Just you know, understand everybody's position and, and there's something out there for everybody and make sure that you're learning why it is they like what the, what it is and what the differences are and, and how their process works. So learn. Everything they said, <clears throat> and um, find a what, like what John said with find a group. If you can't find, you can find a group and find a mentor, somebody that you've that's been in the industry for a while, that's gone through all the crap that we've gone through, and that's willing to share. And if you if you're not at the point of finding a mentor, be a mentor. And all my interns that have come through, and I've had I don't know, a bunch, but they've all gone on to pretty good careers in IT because. They had me, and they always knew they could come back to me and bounce stuff. Almost said something bad there. Bounce stuff off me, and uh, yeah, th that's probably the biggest thing is that the sponge element and find groups and people that are of a like mind and never ever stop learning. Yeah, it's kind of it's the analogy of uh, why do you keep learning, and then the question is if you're in a jet and you're in the air, why do they keep the engines running? Because bad things happen if they stop. Yeah. I appreciate you guys joining us. One last round of applause for our panelists.